evening everyone where you are. Uh, my name is Josephine. I haven't met a couple of you, but I'm excited to see you all here. Um, today we are happy to have uh, Kevin Cockley. Um, he is the Computational and Data Science Research Specialist from the San Diego Supercomputer Center, which is at the University of California, San Diego. We are happy to learn more about machine learning reproducibility, um, as indicated in his title. And I will open up the floor to him and he can tell us more. Welcome, Kevin, please. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Please let me know if uh, you're having any trouble hearing me. Let me start by sharing my slides. I hope you could see those. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So, okay. yeah. Hi. Uh, like Josephine said, I'm Kevin Coakley. I work at the San Diego Supercomputer Center, and I'm also a PhD candidate at the uh, no, NTNU, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, and uh, my talk is on uh, machine learning re reproducibility. A lot of this work has been done by me and my um, advisor, um, Odd Eric Gunderson at NTNU, and so I hope you enjoy. Okay, so first, I'm sure everybody has heard about the reproducibility crisis in machine learning. Um, reproducibility is critical for trust in scientific findings, particularly where in a, with the uh, field with high stake applications like healthcare, autonomous systems, and finance. Um, in one study, um, the they've showed that the accuracy of uh, running uh, training machine learning models from fixing different runs it varied as much as ten percent, and that was even when removing weak models that didn't converge. And um, so the, the, this variation could cause, um, this high variation could cause the results to, to vary enough to challenge findings. And um, perhaps maybe even worst of all is, it doesn't seem like this is uh, well known, this variation. Um, it was a survey of 100 and, or sorry, 901 researchers and practitioners, and they found that over 50% were unaware or unsure about any variation, and 83% uh, were unaware of um, or uncertain of variation caused by their implementation choices. So, um, so, so there's you know reproducibility. It's it, it, all these root models is changing, and it doesn't seem like uh, it's well known by the people who are practicing, and so. When developing or evaluating machine learning models, it's it's critical to understand these sources that are causing this results to be perhaps irreproducible. So when you are um, writing your papers, you could uh, talk about it, or when you are evaluating it, you you could understand maybe why you're not seeing the same results as what has been published. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about what is reproducibility. Um, there's often a lot of confusion between re repeatability, replicability, and reproducibility. Um, these definitions often differ between different scientific disciplines, and they can change as over time as literature evolves. Um, and an illustration of this was uh, when uh, ACM we were coming up with their. Um, uh, badging for reproducibility, um, their first um, go around, um, they defined the terms repeatability, reproducibility, and replicability. But then a couple months later, they came back and they changed it and they switched the definitions of re reproducibility and replicability, where they changed. The, the difference they changed was between, you know, it, reproducibility replicability is done by different teams, but then whether or not the experiment set up was the same or different, they changed that to more in line with uh, information, the NIS, NISTO standard definitions. And so um, for reproducibility, I like something that my advisor, Odd Eric, came up with is looking at reproducibility 
not in terms of who's running the experiment, but in terms of the scientific method and looking at it in terms of are you are we getting the same outcomes? Are we getting the same analysis? Are we getting the same interpretation? And so, you know, when the in 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 a when an independent investigator runs these experiments, what are they seeing as the results? And we came he came up with three different degrees of reproducibility outcomes, reproducibility anal, analysis, reproducibility, and, inter, and interpretation reproducibility. Um, so outcome reproducibility is when the variability does not cause the outcomes to differ. And so if the outcomes don't differ, then presumably the analysis and the interpretation will match. And so then you'll have a re reproducible experiment. Um, then there's analysis re reproducibility where there are variations in the outcomes from the original experiment, but that doesn't change the analysis that it, the results of the analysis and then presumably the interpretation will differ. And then finally, interpretation reproducibility that is where um, the, the you may get different outcomes, you may get a the analysis may differ, but the interpretation of that analysis does is still valid. And so then it's, it, the, in, the interpretation of the experiment is, is reproduced. And then also looking at not only a reproducibility experiments and where they were, you know, what part of the scientific method that it was re reproducing, but then also what artifacts were provided by the original researchers in order to do the experiment so for for so we he bro broke it down into three different types of um artifacts text which is the paper the code that was used to run the experiment and then the data that was used in the experiment and so then Presumably, if you're able to just reproduce it by just the text, you have a very um, generalizable, reproducible paper, whereas sometimes you need the code or the data in order to reproduce experiments. So just looking at like what you have is more, you know, more confidence in how generalized it will be with, with depending on how few of these artifacts are included and um to uh, uh so the so odd eric is, has a paper under review where he looked at um 30 studies and based on these artifacts whether or not he and some of his grad students could reproduce them so he so these were 30 of the most highly cited um, papers in machine learning for, I forget what year, but um, he, for, he, he had to exclude eight of the studies based on just the data wasn't shared. If you don't have the data to reproduce an experiment, it is very difficult because anyone who has run machine learning experiments knows that a, a, a model trained on different data could just uh, is uh, very hard to reproduce, and even just trying to use similar data, especially most of these ones that didn't include data were medical data. That the different, you know, if you have different machines or you have different, like say, radiologists producing the data, you can have a wide variation of the of the type of image data or whatever type of data is included. So, um, so he, so of those, he did 22 studies. And then what he found was he was able to have a success of in 11 of the studies and failed in 11 of the studies. So only 50, 50, only 50% 50 was able to be reproduced. Um, but he, he, he showed that, um, if only data was shared and not the code, then um, only 33% of the studies were be able to reproduce. But if 
you're able to share the code and the data, he was able to, they were able to get to 86% able to reproduce those. And so it, this, this highlights where when you're doing an experiment, you know, how important it is to include both data and code. And so the other thing, other findings that he found was that uh, the, uh, that it didn't really matter the quality of the documentation or the quality of the code or an undocumented code was better than no code and sharing the data was important. Documenting the data was important. And also that includes um, the steps that you use to gather the data or pre-process the data. Those that that code used to do either one of those is just as important as the code for the machine learning experiments for building the models. And, and, and so the other thing I wanted to talk about before I get into the sources of error reproducibility is another common thing that comes up is talking about reproducibility versus portability. And so, um, there's often this confusion between, um, you know, when you're trying to let other people run an experiment to rerun the code that is more um, portability of the, of the code, not reproducibility. Um, the reproducibility focuses on the reliability of the results across different conditions, while this portability focuses on just running it on a different system. Um, and so reproducibility involves verifying the results, analysis, and the conclusion. Um, and it, it, it is affected by both variations in the hardware and the software, where portability refers to being able to transfer the experiments to run on different hardware and computing systems. Um, a portable experiment simplifies recreating the software experiment environment, but it doesn't guarantee the same results. And portability also carries over biases that may not be addressed due to variations in the hardware and software setup. And so if we go back and we look at those, the four degrees and the different artifacts um, for description, obviously, you know, hosting it, the papers published on the publisher's website or a site like archive, um, publishing code is very important. Uh, GitHub and GitLab are very popular. They're also nice because they have other tools, like you'd be able to comment. And so, and you could also see the versions. If the um, authors update it, you could go back and see what changes they've made since they originally published. Um, there's also other repositories like Zenodo or domain specific research repositories. And, um, the code, like I said, should include the ETL code for the data and the code to analyze the results in order for the, it to be portable and easily repro, you know, rerun. And for data, data is often difficult because most people are dealing with large data sets. The problems with small data sets, you know, are 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 easier to deal with, but the ones with the large data sets are difficult because storage hardware is expensive and difficult, difficult to maintain. Cloud storage providers often charge high fees to download the data. Um, I'm also part of a, a uh, project called Open Storage Network, which is allocated through Access CI through NSF, which provides like a um, S3-like service for data. And so if you're interested if you have large data and you're interested in a place to store it in order to share it, um, that might be a, something to look into. And finally, um, so doing the experiment often times, mo a lot of people recommend using uh, Docker to share the environment, the the text, the code, and the data if it's small. Um, but th you know, there's other things that when you publish the code. You should either try and include a Docker container or how to create a Docker container, but there's other things like uh, uh, pip and conda for uh, Python and uh, packrat for the R programming language. And you should include very detailed descriptions about 
um, the uh, environment and the hardware environment in which it runs because the hardware that it runs on will affect the results. Let's see. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about the sources of irre irreproducibility. This is based on a paper that uh, my advisor, Odd Eric, and I worked on where we tried to look at um, several different uh, machine learning experiments and look at what are the factors that cause them to not be reproduced. And um, so we came up with this, uh, this uh, diagram of what we, we brought, we sorted, we came up with six different uh, top level reasons why they are not reproducible. And we sort of map those to the scientific method. So the ones in blue are ones that will affect the outcomes, the red, the, sorry, the yellow is the one that affects like the analysis and the green are one that would affect the conclusions. Um, so we, we came up with study design factors, algorithmic factors, implementation factors, observation factors, evaluation factors, and documentation factors. Um, I'm not going to speak about the study design factors, evaluation factors, and documentation factors. A lot of those are like if you're doing p hacking, or if you over claim results, or if you don't provide access to the data, you could under those are kind of easier to understand why the experiment might not be reducible reproducible. So I'm going to focus on the algorithmic implementation and observation factors. Um, and I do want to give a note on uh, variability. Now, variability isn't bad, so what I'm going to say is, does not mean that you should try to remove um, re uh, variability from your machine learning experiments. Um, randomness is is in there for uh, reg regularization. It helps generalize the models, so it doesn't uh, just learn the specific patterns in the training set. Randomization also speeds up the training process and helps the uh, model converge faster and also you know the the ra you know randomness is also due to the different design decisions like those different frameworks python pytorch versus tensorflow they do things a little bit differently they're both valid but th that will cause variability between experiments depending on what uh, what framework you use so first i'll talk about the algorithmic factors so the first algorithmic factor that we uh, um, identified was uh, hyperparameter op optimization. So the different methods that you use to uh, optimize the hyperparameters for training the model is going to affect the uh, the results. Um, if you have a large computing budget where you could spend more time doing hyper hyperparameter optimization, the more likely you are to get a better result and so people who have access to more compute power may are going to get a different result than people who have less access just based on the amount of optimization they could use for those hyperparameters and then also um the second one is a random weight initialization when um the model when the training begins there's a random initialization of the initial weight and based on that uh, random initialization, it could lead the model to converge to a different uh, local minimum, find a different optimal solution. So that's another algorithmic factor. Um, data shuffling. Um, in order for the data, to, like as I mentioned before, to converge faster for speed, um, the, ran the data is randomly shuffled during the training process. This randomization of the data training is going to cause the outcomes to differ and then batch ordering when due to memory limitations of the gpus um the you can't send all of the data all of the data at once especially if it's like image or video data so the data is often batched into in smaller portions where it could be trained on and so the order that it is um 
trained those batches are trained on during the epoch will also cause slight variations in the model. Um, stochastic layers is another one, like like dropout, which is intended to make the model more robust. Those randomly, like for example, dropout randomly removes certain features that will affect the outcome. Um, and then random feature selections for like a random forest algorithm where it'll randomly select different paths to go down. Um, the features that are randomly slow chosen will influence the outcome. And so uh, for these algorithmic factors, um, you know, the, the stochasticity of these deep learning uh, model training is inherently leads to out, different outcomes along, across the results. Um, we, as mentioned in the introduction, it, it, there's significant performance variations that could result because of these, and these can affect the conclusions. Um, consistent outcomes don't uh, guarantee the robustness of it. it. The variability across many multiple runs needs to be considered. And uh, when reporting um, performance, report a variation over multiple runs in order to um, capture this variability that is inherent in these processes. And so next I'm going to talk about the implementation factors. Um, and so the first implement fact, implementation factor is uh, during a training, um, usually either will set a random seed or it'll automatically randomly select a random seed during the training process, those different random seeds will um, affect the um, the initial weights that are um, that are selected during the initial training. It could also affect uh, the this these random seeds will also affect the order in which the data is randomized during the training process, or the order in which the batches are 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 uh trained on and so um the you know if 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 you set a different random seed than the original authors you're going to get a different outcome um software different frameworks like tensorflow and pytorch will, will can vary can vary results significantly um diff, different software like the library operating systems versions will have different outcome, and even if you're using, say, TensorFlow, different versions of TensorFlow, because they'll either fix bugs, improve algorithms, or other things, that will also change the outcome. So software is, is, a, is a big uh, cause of, big implementation cause of uh, variability, which is why a lot of people use things like, uh, um, Docker and other tools for portability in order to try and when other people try to reproduce it, try to make that easier for them. Um, uh, parallel execution, um, when you're doing floating point calculations, depending on the order in which they are calculated, um, you get different results. So A plus B plus C does not equal C plus B plus A, especially with the when, when you're rounding these floating point cal calculations. Um, um, there's the compiler settings that were used to compile the, these different, uh, um, software, like even in, uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch, there are different parts that are compiled. And so, um, there was a paper that showed, uh, during, during weather simulations across uh, multiple different, uh, systems that had different, uh, in software compiled with different, uh, in Intel compiler operations that it, it uh, changed the uh, floating point calculations, which did came with different results. Um, there's the auto selection of primitive operations. So the um, the C CDUNN and CUDA drivers that are used when you're training on an NVIDIA GPU, they have an auto tune function that will automatically benchmark several different uh, methods of training to see which is faster, depending on how the benchmarks go, you will 
you could get it running different uh, algorithms to do the training process. And then there's also just the processing units of um, different processors will change the results. Um, right now, there is a lot of, uh, most of the training is done, I think, on NVIDIA GPUs. I think that's still safe to say, but because there is so much uh, money going into this machine learning, it's, you know, there are now starting to be a lot of competitors at SDSC, um, the new um, high performance computing system is going to be uh, uh, AMD based. And so it's going to have more a AMD hardware for training these deep learning models and machine learning models. And so, um, you know, while this has been probably less of a problem Currently, I, I expect it will be a larger problem in the future with the different manufacturers making these different processors. I've tested uh, small small machine learning algorithms on different uh, Intel and, and and AMD CPUs, and I, the, it varied widely. Unfortunately, I can't use CPU for most ones, so it, it I have to, we're w waiting to see where how these other hardware perform, but I, I think that's gonna be a big problem in the future where you're gonna see a lot of variation based on these new processing units that are coming out. And then, as I mentioned, rounding errors, um, different hardware and different software implementations uh, round floating point numbers differently. And then when you're running these long calculations where there's I don't millions, hundreds of millions of different Floating point calculations happen to train these models. You're gonna you, you'll see these rounding errors really add up. And so for the implementation factors, you know the the variation in the hardware and the software mirror in, inconsistencies seen in physical labs. And I like to think of the hardware and software training environment for training ML experiments is like a more like a calibrated scientific instrument than just a computer. I think a lot of people think, especially people who are not very familiar with comp computing hardware, they think that, you know, if it runs on my computer, it'll run the same on somebody's other computer, but that's not the case. You know, these, especially like these um, high performance computing systems, these are highly calibrated scientific instruments and they should be treated like such when doing experiments. Um, consistent results requires you to con to control for these different, you have to control for the software, hardware, and the parallelization, and always document and share all configurations to help support reproducibility. And finally, um, the observation factors. So first of all, um, Data set bias, the method that you use to gather the data will will also, you know, whether it's manual automated, you, you, it will, it could introduce uh, different uh, biases into the data set. And so that's one thing, you know, to document so people know how the data was um, captured and then there's uh, the next one is data pre-processing. Um, obviously, a lot of uh, machine learning algorithms, sorry, a lot of machine learning experiments, the, uh, the researchers will pre-process the data in order for it to either, um, to either just work with their models or to speed up the process. And so the, that whatever you, is done with pre-processing needs to be well documented in order to facilitate um, reproducibility. Um, data, data sets are often augmented, adding you know, randomization to it. And so it doesn't, as I mentioned before, doesn't cause the training to just memorize the, the data set that you are training it on. That randomization will also cause the uh, outcomes to differ for machine learning models, uh, different data splits will also affect it. So if you sometimes, in, especially in large data sets, there are um, specific um, points of the data that are 
maybe that could be closer to two different categories and depending on whether or not they are in a the training or the validation or the testing set that could also cause a lot of uh, differences in the outcomes. Um, environmental property. So this is if you're doing like a reinfor reinforcement learning and you have a physical environment in which you are training your machine learning algorithm on the different uh, environmental properties that are in this training environment will cause there to be a different uh, outcomes and then annotation quality. Um, most of the annotations are hopefully done by humans and humans ha don't always have, you know, don't always uh, come to the same conclusion themselves. And you could also have different um, quality of it. So you could either have like, say, undergrads, graduates, or, or PhDs, or people who have had 10 years of experience, that quality of the annotations could also affect the outcome if you're using a different data set to try and verify the outcomes. If, if the quality is not the same, then you might, you'll get different results. And then test data issues. Um, if you have data leakage, if you if you accidentally train the model and some of the test data gets used, gets put in the the training or vice versa, then um, that's called data leakage. And that will cause the model to be, will overestimate the performance. And so for the observation factors, um, yeah, these might affect, that'll affect the outcomes and the interpretations. Bias, the biases and pre-processing impact the outcomes and the interpretations of the models. Um, you can mit mitigate these effects by setting a random seed and thoroughly do mo documenting the data, pre-processing and the providence of the data, careful handling of the data. You wanna make sure there's no duplicate data in the outliers and missing values are are documented to avoid biases. And then lastly, uh, data shifts over time. And so um, if you're reproducing an experiment that was um, done a few years ago and you're using new data, that could also be a big factor in causing the experiment not to be reproducible. And um, so I, I, one of the things I also want to emphasize is that, um, that you simply can't um, remove, like trying to control for one of these factors isn't enough. Um, there was a, Swang did a paper and uh, their conclusion was simply trying to control for one of these or two or multiple of these factors um, wasn't effective unless you controlled for all of them. And so if there's just one of these factors that is left, um, uncontrolled for the, the results of the, that if the experiment can uh, vary as much as if you didn't control for any. And so I, I, I tried, I did a, a small, simple experiment where I ran a machine learning, uh, I tried train a machine learning model and then I looked at whether or not changing one source, one of these sources versus changing two or more of these sources would cause any more variation. And what I saw was exactly what uh, Schwang said is that, the, that there was no discernible difference whether or not I, there was one or multiple factors changing. So the, this variability is going to be in these experiments unless you're able to reproduce it completely, same hardware, software, data, everything, code. So it is something that everyone does have to be aware of. and keep in mind when they're doing the, when you're reproducing experiments, but also when you're publishing the experiments, that's why it's important to include a range of results that includes this variation. And so in, in, in conclusion, um, so it, your reproducibility, you know, this is a complex challenge, multiple factors from algorithms, implementation and data handling. Um, it's all connected, but you know, there is, no single fix, like Docker containers will fix the problem. 
um, prying, setting random seeds isn't going to solve the problem. It's that that it needs to be, you know, if it, if the whole pipeline if the whole pipeline hasn't been um, standardized, then there is going to be variation. And, and finally, I you know share your share your code and data. If you don't share the code and data, then you're making uh, the possible the challenge of reproducing your experiments very difficult, if not impossible. And so um, that's the last slide. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Very, very insightful. We'll open up the floor for questions from the audience. Um, where is it? Okay. All right. Hello, Kevin. Good afternoon. Hi. Thank you for sharing your research and the findings. So I was uh, just uh, I have a question and uh, if you can help me. So actually I was uh, trying uh, uh, my deep learning model using AWS, but I see when I uh, train my model only using CPU and uh, when I train with CPU and when I train on GPU, I get different kind of optimization uh, scores like the trading loss or evaluation loss. So, did you, uh, uh, so from your knowledge, can you uh, give me some uh, knowledge on um, come some insight on this, or you can refer some um, related works where I can find if they discussed any reason for this. Like, if I train the model uh, using CPU, then I get different uh, training uh, characteristics. But I use same model with same data, same data preprocessing on GPU, then I get a different kind of optimization and evaluation uh, results. So what can be the okay. possible reason or how can I mitigate this? Right, so, uh, so yeah, so when you train on a CPU that it is using math libraries that are within say like Python or associated with Python. Yeah, and so it's, it's I've Python noticed... and actually I, I use TensorFlow, Keras TensorFlow for that model. Right, and, and I use Adam so, optimization for both cases. Right, and so when you, and so at least like if you use like Anaconda Python on a mm -hmm. CPU with mm -hmm. TensorFlow, I believe there's also if you could also look there is um, there are the math libraries that come with Python, and then there's also a package where you could get the Intel math libraries, which will also give you a significantly different result, but. Mm -hmm. I, I, this is not maybe my expertise, but I would guess that when you're doing it on the GPU, you're mm -hmm. sort of bypassing a lot of that and you're going into the CUDA CDUNN mm -hmm. realm where they have a lot of the optimization of all of these different math functions done by, the, you know, these in, these. NVIDIA libraries and even between running these different libraries versions, I've seen a lot of variation. And so um, I, I, I don't know, I'm just, I'm, I, I don't know the exact answer to your question, but my guess is that, uh, that these Intel, I'm sorry, these NVIDIA um, libraries are using uh, GPU specific um, optimization because with the, the different with the many more cores and the way that it processes on the GPU, they could do very you know very different sort of calculations in order to train these models. Yeah, that's that's the, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your. Uh -huh. Yeah. Very good. Wait, can I jump in for a question? Yes. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Kevin, for the really comprehensive talk. It's it's very helpful. Um, I have questions around uh, interdisciplinarity in research. 
uh, I know several of the things you talked about, like the irreproducibility and pa parts of the research life cycle that that are that can be reproduced or can can enhance the reproducibility. When you are working in interdisciplinary spaces, like in iHeart, we often do that data scientists and polar science uh, experts and so on. Do you think it becomes more challenging or are there other best practices that we have to keep in mind in addition uh, in formulating those hypotheses that could ensure more reproducibility? Or do they lead to more irreproducibility? Because a lot of this is exploratory analysis in some cases. Yeah, yeah, and please let me know if I'm not answering the question correctly, but yeah, so a lot of the, you know, research papers that you see are very specific. And so when you try and go to like different domains or, diff you know, even different data sets, you can get very, wide, you know, wildly different um, uh, results. Um, so, like, if you use a different data set, you'll get a different result. And so, um, which is why w when I talked about reproducibility, I talked about it sort not as um, getting the same results, but getting the same um, uh, same outcomes, the same analysis, and the same uh, conclusions. Because so if you do, you can run different machine learning experiments on different data. But if you use different data that might require you also, like if the paper says my algorithm, my machine learning process is better than, you know, researcher A's, that means that you might also have to redo researcher A's results or reproduce their experiment in order to compare the results in order to see if you could come to the same conclusion. Um, it is. You know, yeah, it, I mean, trying to reproduce the data in a different domain, it, it is very difficult. I, I think also part of the problem is a lot of um, machine learning uh, research is done on benchmark data sets. And so um, it's not necessarily clear to me where when uh, a different model, you know, when somebody says their model uh, performs at X, percent better, whether or not that it is a generalizable um, result, or if they were able to just optimize for the benchmark that they are using. And so that is also a problem, you, you know, maybe if you see an experiment that is tested on multiple data sets and it performs better on multiple data sets, that's better. But a lot of times, it, it, a lot of the conferences are accepting research that is based on getting the highest result and not necessarily, you know, it's, it's how they look at the top number of the uh, accuracy and not necessarily the robustness, how well it generalizes to other problems. And so, um, yeah, the, the problem of uh, generalizing experiments across the uh, Domains and fields is, is, I don't know if that has been really a focus mm -hmm. of machine learning research at the moment. Um, hopefully, mm -hmm. as the, 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 the field uh, matures more, that it'll be, but like, especially if you've done stuff like image recognition or uh, image classification, there's only a few benchmark data sets that everybody uses. And so, yeah. Um, yeah. whether or not we're making progress or we're just getting really good at uh, solving these benchmarks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's very important because in some cases, if you're solving an entirely new problem, the benchmarks may not even exist. Uh, you mentioned image processing and there are some problems in iHeart where we look at very fine grained image images like under the ice, ice layers, which are very fine grained and the benchmarks don't even exist. So the algorithms may work on your uh, non fine grained images, but may not work on, uh, you know, it's very hard to prove their validity on, on fine grained benchmarks because the data doesn't exist. Um, yeah. In some cases, it's possible to do that for other types of data sets that you show the generalizability, but for some more complex problems where you 
um, don't have the benchmarks, that's going to be a problem. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, this is a major problem, I think, in uh, medicine where people are, are reporting really neat and interesting findings for like finding, say, like cancer masses or something automatically through different imaging. They publish the results. They could publish the code, but they can't publish the actual images, the medical um, artifacts that are used for the training. And so you, you have to just take it at their word that, uh, they're, that what they're saying is true. And I, well, I'm not as familiar with the geo, but with medical stuff, I mean, it is different machines will have different, you know, if you different brands of machines will make different, very different images. Just the, I've read um, papers where they've had problems with just the, uh, the competency of the radiologist taking the, uh, um, what, you know, to the MRIs or whatever imaging that they're using, you know, like a, a new radiologist doesn't position the body necessarily in the same spot as a more experienced one. And so, yeah, general, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it, it is a big problem. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question. Um, given this, you know, you've examined different sources of irreproducibility. Back to the beginning, I think with Odd Eric's experiment on trying to see how they were able to reproduce the uh, different studies. Um, for those that were fully or reproduced bathazon or not, is there a way to quantify? Um, have a way to quantify the reproducibility. Um, for example, can we get a scale or a range that can be used to objectively, you know, quantify what can be accepted as reproducible? Right. Reproducible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the way they did it in the paper is they did a they limited it as a, a success, which meant that. Um, if, if there were multiple research questions, all of the research questions, they were able to validate a partial success. And then if there was multiple research questions, they were able to answer at least one of the research questions. As far as like, um, it, we, I haven't really looked into whether or not, like, if there is a range, it's either because most of these experiments, they're um, uh, publishing numbers, so like 95% accurate or, and so if, so the, in this case, it was, is it what they said, yes or no? It wasn't sort of like a, a more, um, uh, more, uh, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but the more qualitative, a response where, you know, it's, is, is it almost, you know, is it, how close did it get or is this better? It was more of just a binary question of were all the research questions answered or were they not all answered? And so that was how this experiment was run. Have you seen, oh, um, explored any research studies that have sort of looked at ranges um, or scales of irreproducibility or reproducibility? Have there been any research studies in that space? Not that I'm aware of. It's mostly just like, yeah, were, were you able to, were the, the research questions properly answered? And, you know, that, that all, I mean, it is difficult because Research questions can vary quite wildly from paper to paper. They could be very related to the topic or they could be less related. And so, um, yeah, that, that, that has been sort of the, the, our, our, the focus that was done for this paper. Yeah. Thank you so much. Do we have any other questions? Can I go ahead? 
Yeah, yes, please. Uh, thank you uh, for your presentation. I am quite curious to know that if you have a customized data set, that means uh, I just want to uh, know your take on it. So if you have a customized data set, that means that you should not run the state of the art model which exists in the community. Community in the sense, I come from a computer vision uh, domain actually. So, uh, so if there are Imaginate and all other data sets are there. So now if you are working with the glacial data set, so uh, what is your suggestion? You should not uh, use the state of the art or we should use the state of the art on the all the algorithms which are being run and to see whether it works simultaneously what it has given in the benchmark data sets. Yeah, I mean, yes, if you have the time and the resources, I, I, I think it would be great to be able to test and verify um, different. And, and so I, and I do want to uh, differentiate between running the experiment completely versus say, you know, this means like, you know, training and all that stuff versus using a model that has been pre-trained because a lot of um, the pre-trained models that you get out there for like vision transformers or ResNets or des de dense nets, you can get pre-trained ones that have been trained on ImageNet. And if you use their models and you adapt them, if you, um, you know, do uh, transfer learning in order to do like, um, to, uh, you know, to do like one shot learning in order to improve their models on your data, you, you know, you probably, you, you know, you'll definitely get higher results than if you try. Well, I, yeah. I shouldn't say you definitely will. You, you'll probably get higher results if you use these pre trained models because they've spent, you know, somebody has spent the time to, to, you know, it, to train resident takes, you know, sometimes days depending on the model. And so that, you know, not everybody has that um, ability. I mean, if you do have the ability, the resources and the time to do it, that's great. You might be able to get a better result than what they are saying, or, or maybe even using these pre-trained models, but I, no, my my take was uh, actually I run a kind of eleven state of art model actually, and I got a kind of a pretty sequential results. What is being done in the uh, benchmark data set versus my data sets? I mean, it is no, near not hundred percent, but ninety nine percent similar. And using the pre trained models, I mean, it is those are not pre trained models. These are all, I mean, the CVs. I mean much sophisticated at the end actually uh, i do not use their weights to train it i trained it from the scratch okay. and yes uh, for six to seven of them the availability of the codes are there and four are not there i try to replicate as much as good possible i mean do you think that's a good practice actually for a particular customized data sets yeah yeah, I mean, I th yes, if you're, if you're able to, and you have the time and the resources to train the models from scratch. Yeah, I think it's good. I mean, I, the, I mean, there's definitely the state of the art models. I'm, I mean, I'm not trying to say that the state of art models are only um, the state of the art because they've optimized for a specific benchmark. Um, they, 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 you know, if you look at them, they are improving. And so definitely, you know, the, you should look at those and try if you can train it on your own data and and it does do better than the pre-trained weights. I, I think that is good. I mean, you could probably also, um, be, you know, maybe even use smaller models. Um, one the thing that I've been looking at more most recently is um, the robustness of these models because um, it does take a lot of time to train and and depending on the size of model, a lot of money to train these models. And so there is a, um, so looking at it as like a, uh, a training it multiple times and looking that at that as a, um, uh, a distribution of results 
and then looking to see which models have a chance of underperforming. And if if the, the time that is spent training, looking at which models are the most robust, which are more maybe not maybe are a half a percent less um, accurate, but if they are more often than not to get closer to the mean than the uh, you know the the one that has the better mean, maybe you're better off going on using train spending your time training these models that are um, more robust, where you're more likely to get closer to the mean than where you know you can get an outlier to where you've spent all this time training it, but you didn't actually get close to the mean. Results. Right. Thank you. And I have just a last uh, question. When you talk about the robusticity, did you consider the adversarial impacts on uh, impact on the data for the robusticity? Actually, um, so yeah, I, I, we've well, we've uh, we looked at training it on different data sets, and then also um, different ways of shuffling the data, different ways of yeah. So. Um, so we, we are kind of stuck on this with using the different benchmark data sets. We don't have our own data sets to, um, to use. And so, uh, maybe, I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I can throw in 1 question before two minutes sure. wrap up. Um, so. In cases of you, you ended the presentation with saying, share your data, share your code. Uh, in cases where the data sets are restricted, how, what is your advice um, to support the reproducibility? Because we have a couple of those that, that I have that cannot be published. Yeah. So, yeah, that is unfortunately, that is a difficult problem because without the data, it may be impossible to uh, validate it. Um, Obviously, um, you know, training it, training the same model on a public data set would be nice and reporting those results also. But yeah, I mean, if, if, if there is like reason, like, you know, medical for privacy reasons, or if it's like proprietary data where it just can't be shared because you don't own the data. Yeah, I, I mean, there's something that I, you know, something that. It would be nice, like if publishers are were able to get involved in like figuring out a way that it could be shared with one person that or one or two people that could verify the results. But as far as, yeah, I mean, if if especially if you're dealing with proprietary data where you can't even um, anonymize it or you know figure out a way to make it publicly available, that yeah, I. Yeah, we haven't done too many experiments on trying to reproduce paper where the data isn't available just because it's such a hard problem to solve. Thank you so much. Um, oh. For any follow up questions, please, you can reach out directly to Kevin. Um, his information is also part of IHARP's website. You can check him out. And his yes. email is provided right here. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh -huh. um, and we appreciate you taking the time to share all of this. Uh, it's definitely been helpful. And we'll be okay. following up with any other questions. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your time. Thank, Thank you. you.